Hello, it's Scott Manley here. We love to talk about rocket engines on this channel. We talk about the propellants, the pumps, the combustion chamber, the nozzles. But you know what? Once the gas has flown out that nozzle, we tend to forget about it. I mean, we might pay attention to an awesome looking shock diamond that is there hanging there. But, you know, you have to appreciate that while there is some permanence to that uh, Mach diamond, the gas that's flowing through there is shooting through it at the speed of sound, and we are forgetting about it. And so this brings me to a deep space question, which was posed by one of my supporters over at Patreon. Jacob Homola asks, what happens to rocket slash spacecraft exhaust after it is exhausted from the rocket engine? Mostly in orbit. Does it deorbit, stay in orbit? Does it interact with other spacecraft, causing them to experience additional drag? And, you know, this is one of these questions which, of course, I have a pretty good idea of the answer of, but I'd never really thought to make a video about it. So you look, when you have a rocket engine, you've got most of the reaction happening inside the combustion chamber, and hopefully the reactions have ceased by the time it hit, they hit the throat, and it starts to expand out through the nozzle. And the nozzle is a device which is designed to take the gas which is moving at, super, at the speed of sound, and then expand it in such a way that it accelerates more and more. And as the gas accelerates through the nozzle, it's still behaving like a gas. The atoms and molecules are all bouncing off of each other. But once it leaves that, it very quickly expands and cools, and the gas basically becomes collisionless. It's spread out too much into space. Now, the dispersion of velocities is some like model of like a, a you know a Gaussian type distribution. Actually, it's probably not Gaussian. There's a very specific shape, I'm sure. But the point is, it's not like a hard cutoff. There's not one single speed or one single direction. These gases, these atoms or molecules are expanding outwards. And if you look at rocket engines, we talk about the specific impulse. Well, the specific impulse is sort of like the average velocity with which the molecules are leaving the engine. Of course, this average, again, it's a distribution, and because the directions are not all quite the same, you lose a bit of a specific, you lose a bit of speed from that. But yeah, you know, your average engine has specific impulses measured about, you know, 300 or slightly more uh, seconds. And you multiply that by the acceleration of gravity, 9.8, so roughly 10 meters per second, you get that the average rocket engine is spitting out exhaust at about three kilometers per second. So if you're firing your engine in low Earth orbit and you're accelerating to, say, leave orbit, then that gas is slowing down and is going to fall back to Earth. So, yeah, that's what's happening in that case. If you are speeding up, however, you're pushing that stuff out at about three kilometers per second. That's not quite enough to, say, get it out of, you know, to escape velocity, but is it enough to kick it up into a higher orbit? Having said that, these particles, they're very small. They're not like physical objects. I mean, you can treat them as individual particles, but those individual particles do interact with the, the environment around them. Um, now, the typical gases that come out of a rocket are things like uh, water or you know, hydrogen, hy dihydrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. Those are pretty common. And those will actually get split, photolysized by uh, ultraviolet radiation in space. So they tend to break down into their individual atoms. Uh, and once they do that, they get ionized and then they will get entrained by things like the Earth's magnetic field or even the solar wind. And they will slow down and become part of that environment. Now, when the engine fires in low Earth orbit, you know, you, you have to imagine that it's expanding into a vacuum, but as I've mentioned before, it's really just a tenuous upper atmosphere. And you'll notice that if you get a nice sunset launch, you'll get a nice jellyfish. And that's because the in the sort of 150 kilometer altitude, the atmosphere is still thick enough that as the exhaust gases expand, they push up around about against the atmosphere around them and they form this sort of wall where the exhaust gas is piling up into the atmosphere and getting concentrated enough. And as it's getting like you know, densified by this process, th that means that the exhaust gases are getting squeezed down enough again that they're starting to interact with each other. But now they've cooled. So the water in that exhaust starts to condense, it starts to freeze and you get ice crystals. And the same thing happens with the carbon dioxide. And that's what we actually see reflected in the sunlight when we get these perfect launches. You've got this sort of densified region where the exhaust is recondensing into solid objects that can scatter the sunlight and put on an amazing show. Now, 
sometimes the launch happens a few hours before sunrise and we don't see it because the trail itself is not it doesn't get high enough to catch the sun but that gas all those crystals and everything those still exist and they begin percolating down slowly and if you get things right they will actually settle in the upper atmosphere descending very very slowly and they will form these very very high altitude clouds and because they're high up they will catch the sunlight you know maybe an hour or more before anything else and these are called noctilucent clouds they are clouds which illuminate at night I guess this also happens if you launch like a couple of hours before sunset so these are phenomena that we can start to look for now let's think a bit more about the physics of the situation rocket engines work through the conservation of momentum right we're essentially throwing exhaust in one direction and to conserve momentum the spacecraft has to move in the other or has to accelerate in the other now they also have to conserve energy and this leads to an interesting observation about the Oberth effect. Now you probably have heard about this effect if you play Kerbal Space Program. This is where you know you swing down close to a planet, pick up a lot of extra speed and fire your rocket engine and you come out with even more speed. What the Oberth effect actually says is that uh, it observes that since energy goes as velocity squared and the force, um, you know, the rocket has the constant excel, uh, constant force regardless of its speed. A rocket which is accelerating at higher speeds is generating more energy. So by swinging down into the gravity well, you're actually getting more velocity out of it. And it's one of these things that sort of makes people uneasy. They say that surely that doesn't conserve, you know, the laws of physics. Surely there's energy conservation problems going on. Well, the funny thing is when you start to think about the exhaust, you start to realize, oh, this actually makes sense. Because if you come down, swing down into you know, low Earth orbit, your, or low planetary orbit, and you're firing that engine, you're going faster, and this exhaust is going slower. Well, that exhaust now, it's going into a lower orbit, or even worse, it's falling into the planet. And so you're actually, you're robbing, the exhaust is losing energy. It's losing more energy than it would otherwise have lost if it were in deep space. And so that's one sort of explanation for how you know, these gravitational slingshot effects can actually work when you're using rocket engines close to the surface. And, you know, there is actually an analog of this. There's a guy, I think it's Roger Penrose, he studied, one of the things he looked at was black holes, and he came up with this process for extracting energy from spinning black holes by putting stuff in and having, you know, he was talking about things that would push themselves apart and one particle would fall into the black hole and the other one would come out with more energy. This is exactly the same process. Now, he started looking at uh, spinning black holes, but the process works with uh, you know, regular black holes, and it's a, it's a way to convert, you'll get a lot of energy out because you're essentially extracting the, the rest mass of the stuff in terms of gravitational energy. Okay, so other things, other effects that we can see from uh, rocket exhaust. Um, lunar landing on the moon so we've obviously talked we've talked about this in the past that when you're landing on a planetary surface you've got a rocket engine firing down it's going to cause some spread in the surface and that's not such a bad problem on the moon because typically you're using a large vacuum expanded nozzle and so you're expanding the exhaust over a larger area it's a bigger problem on mars where the atmosphere tends to squeeze things together and it tends to you know bury down into the surface and dig a hole but there's another effect that during the Apollo missions, apparently there is like some detectable signature that showed that the Apollo missions mo significantly modified the atmosphere of the moon. The atmosphere of the moon, the, you know, the moon does appear like a vacu vacuum, right? It has about 10 tons of atmosphere that is, you know, close enough to it to be observable. These are things like sodium and potassium ions that are sputtered off the surface or kicked off the surface by various processes, you know, solar uh, radiation and uh, meteor impacts and things like that. So this is an extraordinarily low uh, density atmosphere. I think it masses about 10 tons. So when the Apollo program is firing multiple tons of rocket thrust in the at in you know, near the moon, that is adding a huge amount of atmosphere to the moon. It changes the chemistry in a way that could be measurable. And this is going to happen for any object where you've got a spacecraft landing and there is no sort of native environment. The spacecraft are actually going to be off gassing. Like you know, they, they take off from the Earth and they've got hydrogen and whatever in them and that is freezing. So this 
water then slowly sublimates and it's going to be sublimating near the land landing site. So wait, it turns out there are a lot of missions that have to look at uh, stuff on the surface of the moon, have to think about these processes to make sure they're not bringing contamination with them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing. The rocket exhaust can actually literally change planetary atmospheres. Operating rocket engines in low Earth orbit near other spacecraft is also a big problem because you're blowing the exhaust out and it can actually hit the other spacecraft. When you're performing what is called proximity operations, when you're trying to bring a spacecraft to the space station to have it dock, they carefully plan these trajectories so that they have to perform the least number of engine fires towards the space station. They prefer to fire away from the space station where possible. The space shuttle actually had a special mode on its RCS, its reaction control thruster system, where it could use like thrusters which were angled out away from the cargo bay. And this was something they only figured out like partway through the development. Uh, this gave them like a 90% reduction in the efficiency of the system, but it meant that they wouldn't be firing thrusters directly at the target. And if you think about it, when you're trying to rendezvous with a target, naively you're coming towards it, you're firing your engines to slow down, but you're firing your engines directly at it. So this is why you'll get spacecraft performing loops around the space station and then coming in on the, you know, towards it from one direction or another, because this is minimizing the amount of interaction between these, uh, you know, the thrusters and the space station. There's actually video showing after the one of the early space uh, space telescope servicing missions where they leave one of the panels in orbit and they're firing the thrusters and you can see the solar panels wobbling or bouncing around in reaction to the thruster or, you know, energy that's coming out that way. Now, if we go deeper into space, as I said, like the chemistry sort of breaks down over time, right? The, the exhaust gas breaks down and becomes ions and on Earth it will get entrained in the magnetic field and fall back. Once you get out to deep space, something else happens. The exhaust... Uh, it's going to get caught up in the solar wind and the solar wind will then carry these, you know, exhaust atoms and molecules off into interstellar space, right out to like the heliopause where the solar wind piles up against the edge. So I'm sure, you know, there's some trace out there of human activity on the edge, probably not in the form of hydrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's far too boring. That stuff comes off the earth. But uh, xenon, Right? That's a pretty rare element to find out there. That will all be collecting at the heliopause and maybe in enough... I, I, I should actually do the math to figure out what kind of signature we would expect for the noble gases and whether that would be a clue as to whether a star system has some sort of a, you know, technology or whatever going on inside it. That's, that's another idea. And of course, you know, when you're firing when you're working with electric thrusters, the electric thrusters, they're accelerating the noble gases or whatever through electromagnetic fields, and they have to be ionized to make that work. Well, part those people that work on those engines, they can't just ignore those ions that they're kicking off into space. They have to think about the exhaust after it leaves the uh, like the channels. So they actually have to have neutralizers that are firing electrons into this to make sure that the ions are correctly neutralized so that they don't come back to the spacecraft. And I think I talked about Hayabusa 1, where they had two half engines. One engine was working, but it didn't have a neutralizer, and the other engine had a neutralizer that was working. So they were able to actually keep, they were able to get the functionality of one engine to complete their mission. But that's, uh, you know, another fine example of uh, rocket engines. So I hope you found this interesting. Uh, and of course, if you want to ask questions, go to my Patreon. Uh, ask there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.